the mortar is broken. Let's go, fast! Go! Oh, the rocket, the rocket! Get down, get down! The Russian soldiers woke up. Broke it. There was a whistle. Let's go to the other side. The shelling is on. Run, run! Ukraine is our country. Come on, get down. Quickly. UAV drone. UAV drone. Let's go. Drone. Wow. My name is Dmitro Kamarov. I'm Ukrainian, a journalist, a traveler. One year ago, on February 24th, my life changed forever, same as the life of each of us. Before that, I discovered and studied the most interesting corners of the world, it's in the past now. Before that, each of us had a different life, which became the best exactly one year ago on February 24th. Each of us remembers walking up to this new life. Try to recall how it was for you. And how did the full-scale war begin for? Hello, Mr. Zelensky. Hello. A year ago, when you walked through that door, the war has started. It is shocking for everyone. The war has started, and it's a tragedy. Could we recreate your morning minute by minute, starting with waking up? It's hard to remember every detail. I got a call. They told me that the whole thing had started. We woke up. My wife, my family, my son and my daughter. Do you remember what you said when you were leaving your house? I definitely thought about waking the kids up, packing up everyone, to tell the kids what was happening, what the war had started. They are big, they must understand what is happening, because we will act in accordance with the war time. And basically, I left very fast. I love my family, but for me, as a president, being here was my priority. And then, in a couple of hours, they arrived here. It was dangerous to stay here. The security said that they couldn't be there. That's why they came here. Was there a moment when you looked into your wife's eyes on the way out and felt like you didn't know the future, whether you would come back or not? You know, in my past life, I used to know something about making movies. And such a thing as, you know, looking into each other's eyes and thinking, perhaps we won't see each other again. We didn't have time for such romance. May the audience forgive me, because we were kind of busy. Busy with other things. I packed up really quickly and came here. By the way, it was dark here in the corridors at the Bankova Street. This office, the phones, the team I had to gather, those were the only things I remember I was thinking about. Can I see the place where the first calls were made? Yes, of course. But it's not here. Not here. Are the phones in another room? Yes, they are. All international calls are made right here in this office. The calls that night of Turin that morning were no exception. According to the official data, there were 27 presidents with whom you spoke in the morning of February 24th. Many people called me the presidents, the prime ministers, various leaders. Yeah, it was like call after call. Did you think about calling Vladimir Putin? In those days, I didn't. I wanted to call him before the war. And we gave the signal and we requested a conversation. And I thought it was very important that he told Ukraine and the Ukrainians in person that there would be no invasion. I also asked various partners that they contact Russia. We requested the conversation several times, but 
They were not ready. So Vladimir Putin was refusing to talk. No one refused me directly. But all the leaders I talked to said he was not ready to talk. And now do you have a wish or no, the intention to talk? No. Now it's me who is not ready to talk to him. All of Ukraine so it was 6.42 a.m. When your first video appeal was made on February 24th, it was shot without any professional lighting, and it looked like a selfie on the phone. It was like that, right? It was made here. Right here? Yes. Here is a picture of your... Oh, is there now? Yes, here it is. Is there, right? Yes, it is. Nothing changed. Around 5 a.m. you made your first appearance in the cocky t-shirt. How did that decision to change the official dress code to a military one come around? I remember that it was uncomfortable. And that moment all of us had already changed inside. Everything had changed, life had changed, and it was impossible to return to what had been before. I had the clothes that I used to wear when I went to the front line. I have a small wardrobe here. May I have a look? Of course, the clothes there are just all similar. The president's closed. Yes, such kind of a wardrobe. This is what I wear. Well, such casual things. Where are your military clothes and shoes? Yeah. And what about that suit? Well, I think the suits are right here. Oh, after the dry cleaner, right? Maybe. To be honest, I don't follow that kind of stuff. And I just don't wear suits now. Is this that very suit? I think it is. This is a symbol. It means that the war will end soon. We will win soon, so we'll wear suits again. So this suit is waiting for our victory. Yes, it does. I wish it came sooner. It will come. I can't surprise you with anything else. Sorry, but we're used to turning off the lights everywhere because we're saving as much as we can. It's a habit now. Did you spend nights here as well? I did. May I have a look? The place? Yes. Okay, let's go. This is where I live. This is the president's bed and you slept here on February 24th and 25th, right? That's right. We also went down to the bomb shelter. But in general, I live here. In fact, you might say that this office is your home. This is my home. I've been living here for a year now. Sometimes I make my appeals here. Sometimes I hold meetings here. I see the frame. It must be your family. It's my family. May I have a look? Yes, you may. Very nice photo. My kids wanted a Superman. God help you reunite with your children and be smiling as soon as possible. And all of us forget about the war. Even after the war, we will not forget about the war. Mr. President, on February 24th, when the tension was extraordinary with a subversive group in Pachersk. Did you imagine that the Russian could enter through this door? What to do in such a situation? Everyone imagined this. Not that I was thinking about it, but my bodyguards constantly reminded me of this. Did you think that you could be killed that day? Even when you hear that about yourself, it's terrifying. Now it was told to pack up because I was the target, and such that they have to do everything they can to get me to a safe place. At that moment, I reckon, anyone would be thinking about something else. I didn't think about what might happen with me. Again, this is not about bread. I thought about the consequences of my living and what would happen. That responsibility is on me. If I live, no one will ask afterwards about who suggested it, etc. They will be only the result. You have abandoned your state. I think you've committed treason. I'm talking to you and I feel we have not been talking so closely since the time of your past life. It's amazing that you haven't changed. You haven't changed inside, but you've changed a lot of the outside. And now, when I'm looking into your eyes, I want to say that they show the pain you feel. I can't tell my eyes what to do. They show what they show. Everything is all right. We have an upcoming event, we must let the president go. We still have a lot of questions. Could we find an opportunity somehow? Well, we'll find it. Thank you. Good evening. 
Good evening. I'd like to offer you... Yes, please. Tea, coffee, cookies. A lot of kinds of tea here. We have Carpathian and Molfar tea. There is a tea with mint, green tea, carcade. This is where it becomes difficult. It was easier at first. I chose drinks for you to my taste. Yeah, thank you. Here you go. Thank you. The Crimean Artek baffles Volodymyr. They taste like our childhood. How soon it will be? The Arctic camp? Ours again. We'll get it back. You see, we're advancing little by little. I can see what's written here. Yeah, I lost my sight. It's physical, but on the contrary, I think that I can see people. This is not metaphoric. Are you really talking about your eyesight? Yeah, I... yeah. We worked a lot without bright light, because we didn't use the bright light. Our security told us, make it less bright. So we worked for many months, so my eyesight got a little worse. Do you currently use contact lenses? No, I don't use them. I read with my glasses on. Now it's like that. I, it's all right, it's fine. That's what makes Ukrainians different here. The candy is called train to victory, you see? Such a sweet victory. Yes, here it is. Since Soviet times, the Russians have used an armored train. Have you thought about armor in a carriage? You are in the usual one, until you said that people thought that we had an armored one. But now that you've said it, it means I revealed a state secret. Another one. <laughs> Sorry about the Hollywood movies. I let myself to make a joke. That's nothing compared to what is happening here. The whole plan of the Russians was an impetuous landing of airborne and special forces units and a dashing entry into Kiev. How many airborne troops were supposed to attack Kiev? There were some pretty scary numbers. There were about 30 Air Force planes in the sky at once. So that was the main plan. That was the only plan. No later than in three days to raise the Russian flag over the presidential administration with a change of power. We knew that there would be an attempt to capture the purchase scales close to the Olympiski National Sport Complex. It's very convenient for the helicopters to land there. And then an attempt to accumulate forces and to capture the government district with the office of the president, the government, parliament and so on. They would change the leaders of the country because, in their opinion, the leaders should have fled by that time. If not, they would eliminate them. There were many different opinions, both within the country and from our Western partners about where I should go, flee or hide. And the only thing left for us would be a partisan war, because the Ukrainians would not have surrendered anyway. And no later than the tenth day, let's say, to extinguish any local development of resistance, if any at all. At the same time, the military pickles were coming. The armed forces of the Russian Federation moved by columns of 100 to 200 vehicles. They only moved as a column. And why? Because they didn't count on anything else. They had to create a picture of a mass offensive operation without the option of not surrendering. The spectacular vehicle columns. That's new for me. People say that the Russians are stupid, they didn't understand what the war was imminent, they didn't take fuel trucks with them, their tanks stopped, there was no supply of the ammunition of food. This is all true, but a completely different truth. The fact is, they counted on no longer than three days, so they didn't need at all. All crews and the Russian leadership were transported in more comfortable conditions. If I understand correctly, their plan was to bring people to comfortable conditions to occupy Kiev. Absolutely. To occupy the city so they were not exhausted and could arrive at the meeting point, get on the military vehicles and be ready to complete the tasks. I believe that in Russia, military science is developed at a fairly high level. So addressing such an issue as the implementation of a full-scale aggression against Ukraine, the preparation and the planning of these measures were carried out compounded, which concerns all areas of activity of the armed force of the Russian Federation. 
operation. Trust me, I'm sure of it. This operation was planned quite thoroughly. In four days, at the maximum rate, Sberbank of Russia bought up all the cash that they could buy. And it was all accumulated in their depository. Which means they were waiting for the contingent to come and then they would open the boat and to implement the policies they needed with their contingent by simply handing out cash. And if they still had managed to land and enter, sorry, but Kiev would have been taken. February 23rd, around 3 p.m., I reported to President Zelensky that tomorrow at 4 a.m. everything should start. At 3 or 2 a.m., I gave the command to close the airspace over the territory of Ukraine. At 3.40 a.m., there was the first battle on the border. It was the Luhansk region. I reported to Denis Monastersky, the Minister of Internal Affairs. At 4 or 5 a.m., General Zolozhny, the commander-in-chief of the armed forms of Ukraine, called me and said that it all had started. Then there were the first missiles. I gave the command to destroy all targets within the zone of destruction of anti-aircraft missile systems with an immediate report to the general staff. I reported to the president when we realized that this wasn't a provocation. This was a full-scale military invasion of the Russian Federation on our territory. It was 5.17 a.m. We are here till the end. We will fight. Emotionally, we were ready to kill the enemy and not to wait for them to come down and leave us alone. The most important thing was to delay the landing and the hostile airfield. The situation developed extremely fast. The enemy landed his special forces in Hostomel. They immediately had huge losses. After several hours of fighting, they took control of our airfield. And then the situation was already taken under control by our artillery. I mean, their plan failed on the first day. Eight years of war made us stronger and taught us to fight, which the Russians did not expect from us. How did we prevent them from landing their planes in the Burisville and Giuliani airports? Everything was mined, vehicles were placed upside down, and moreover, we poured all runways with oil, so landing was impossible. Returning to this legendary phrase about a cab and weapons, where exactly did you say it? To whom? Do you remember that? I said it to President Biden. President Biden was, in fact, the first person. I guess this way my first overseas call. And he, he talked about living. I didn't agree, because I know what the capital of any state is. If the capital falls and the leader flees, there is no more state. Today is our historic moment to fight back against this enemy. We are near the Dnipro River, and the Republic of Belarus is on that side. Mr. Dinako, how did everything happen a year ago? Did we blow up the bridge? We blew it up in advance. to make it impossible to use for the enemy military vehicles and personal transportation to Ukraine. Now, the bridge, as you can see, cannot be used. In case of an attempt to make a pontoon crossing, it won't be successful. I'm sure of that. Could you tell us the numbers? How many breakthroughs there were on our border that morning? We're not talking about breakthroughs, entire columns were coming. Columns of enemy vehicles that were coming to Luhansk region on the contact line, to Kharkiv region, Sumy region, Cheniv region, and to the administrative border with temporarily occupied Crimea, including Kiev region from the Republic of Belarus through the Chernobyl zone.
We are up against a tremendously tough situation, so our only chance was to develop such a plan that would allow us to inflict maximum losses to the enemy at the shortest possible time so that would abandon at least achieving their main strategic tasks and focus on others. For the first few days, it seemed to me that I was walking in a dream. Some kinds of parallel reality. Explosions at Podil district in Kiev. Explosions at Elbalon district. I'm so scared. I can't sleep. I just can't sleep. A missile hits a building next to my parents' house. And I just couldn't wrap my head around what was going on. My brain refused to comprehend the reality, to catch up with the reality. Everything is destroyed. How did your brain react? After all, you were in a crazy news flow. I was in a marathon. Quick reaction absolutely to everything. For example, some kind of risk. I don't know if you had it. I think you had it many times. For example, you're crossing the road without seeing a car. The car is driving fast. You're jumping back. You've managed to save your life. It happened. When you were traveling, I think you met some biting beasts, some predators etc. I think you did. Now imagine that this happens every single minute and you either jump back or you fight with a predator and you don't have time to think. You don't realize what has just happened because there comes a new car, new road, new jump. Something like that was going on. We have been to many dangerous places and hot spots, but I couldn't even think that I would see such horrible sinners in my Kiev. That I would take such horrible shots. That I would say what I'm saying now. How we, the military, expected that it would be like that. I couldn't imagine anything like that. Yes, I saw what had been happening in Syria. I saw what had happened to Chechnya, but I couldn't imagine that it would be in Ukraine. I just can't believe that this is real. And that the war came from those people who called themselves our brothers. All Ukrainians who are known in Russia try to appeal to Russians during the first weeks. I'm talking this video especially for those Russians who don't believe and say, show us what is happening. Here, look what is happening. Look what a Russian missile did to a residential building. I also have a huge Russian audience. I appealed to them and they didn't hear you. Sadly, we're seeing that this doesn't help in any way, and the death of civilian people in Ukraine is a celebration in Russian social networks. It's true. Do you think it makes sense to appeal to them at all? What do I think? Sadly, they do not hear. It's like a thick wall, and the fact that they applaud the death of our people instead of mourning this is, of course, this is enormous tragedy. Our psychological state of mind, our world perception was broken. We have never been cruel. But they forced us to be cruel. Angry. I have relatives in Moscow. No one stood up for us. It hurts. There will be the moment when the fragility of Putin's regime will be felt inside their state. Then the predators will gobble the predator off. This is an important moment, but they will need a reason for themselves. And they will remember what Komarov said, what Zelensky said, what somebody else said. They will remember. They will find a reason for themselves to kill a killer. 
That's a good way to put it. Well, nevertheless, that's why I don't think it's redundant. Will it work? Yes, but I don't know when. Many people don't even realize how close the war was to the capital, almost in the capital itself. The same roads that Kiev residents used to drive every day, for example, the Ring Road, they were already exposed to fire. A classic defense was built near Kia. It was combined with the actions of the small groups that conducted active defense and counterattacked. We drove up to their firing positions right next to his stone. Put the car under the trees, facing the road. Put the car under the trees, facing the road, just in case we need to evacuate quickly. There were huge military columns, and we had small groups of quad bikes on pickup trucks. Why did we choose this tactic? How to fight the Russians? We have less artillery, fewer shells, fewer tanks, fewer armored vehicles. What was an option? A column fight a column. We don't have such resources, so you need to be creative. In fact, there's a history, military history, which shows that much smaller armies, in terms of their size and potential, defeated the enemy. This huge mess armed with missiles, aircraft, cannons, millions of shells prompted us to look for an answer. So the peculiarity of this work is that the mortar migrates and the enemy cannot know exactly where it is. Our task is to put it at a place from which the enemy doesn't expect fire. Then we shoot and live quickly before they hit back. Go, 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 go! Close it. Wait, stop, stop, stop! We hide in here. Danger from air shelling. In this case, go straight to a reinforced firing point. If it hits close, go down and inside. And I was quite impressed that it was a reinforced hiding point from the World War II. And there were two howitzers there. It's a historical monument when they carried out this attack on Kiev. The line of defense in many places passed along the World War II defense line. I just can't believe what I'm saying now, but look, the sign which says here in 1921 there was a defense line of Kiev from the Nazi invaders. And now, in the same place, Kiev is being defended not from the fascist invaders, but from Russia. Those points were quite thoughtfully built, and they made it possible to control the approaches to the area and hit the enemy. They were not built randomly, it was the system of Kiev 45 area. Each war has its own scale. The current scale now corresponds to both World War I and World War II. After all, as of today, the front line of the armed forces of Ukraine is 2,330 miles. It's like World War II, absolutely. A war of such a scale, and it requires a lot of efforts every day. Here a mortar is being installed, that is. Now they will lay out the mines, get confirmation from the eyes, and begin to work. The eyes are a drone. The eyes are either a drone or a people on site. The mortar is working. They started smashing. After we fired, we count 37 or 38 seconds before the hit. Then we adjust the shot. The birdie sees where the mine fell, and we adjust our shot accordingly. A hit. Where? Great. Yes, it's great. Where? Look. And now, 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 look. Okay, okay. Okay. Okay, what? Did you hit it? No, this is an adjustment. 50 to the left just now. An adjustment. Our birdie is adjusting. Birdie is a drone. They're preferring the next one. Fire! It flew. The next one. Oh, right where we wanted it. Yeah, yeah. Here, here. What a blast just now. Cool. Again. Here we go! 
people have an idea that some mobile units with drones have come to the area and they are fighting. This is not entirely true. These small units conduct active defense and counterattack. But basically, the entire area is covered by those units that are engaged in permanent defense, because otherwise small groups will be destroyed, the enemy will move forward. Armo is exploding. You can see the detonation smoke and Armo exploding. Here it burnt off the edge. Here they are all intact military vehicles. There are one IFV in the forest. Zoom it on that properly for that. Send another one there. Everyone hide, danger from A. Danger from A. It's a command. It means that something flew in our direction. A 16-story building and tanks are right next to it. How should our guys work when such tactics are used? They know our mentality, that we value human life. They knew for sure that we didn't want to shoot all the residential areas. We were achieving a precise hit to preserve the infrastructure. And the enemy used the same urban areas to protect its military vehicles and personnel, to protect itself using the civilians at their expense. Absolutely. In the eight years of the hybrid war that began in 2014, the Ukrainian armed forces, the defense forces, the Ukrainian army has changed. And these eight years have given them a completely different experience of how to fight the Russians. Now everyone is getting in the cars quickly, because the enemy may already know that we're here. We need to get out of here quickly. What? We're coming out! Let's go, fast! Keep shooting. Drive. We had to inflict maximum losses on the enemy in the shortest time, make him bleed and make him abandon further action in the largest part of the territory of Ukraine. And it worked. Alexander, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Your guys and I were here in March. To be honest, I haven't been here since then, and now the feelings and memories are gloomy. Our guys from the National Police took part in the liberation of Irpin and the battles of Buchal. I was right here with them, and I commanded the police force. That off-road car was good. Yes, it's ours. Is this your off-road car? It's armored. This was our off-road car. A businessman gave us an armored vehicle to perform our tasks, and then it was hit in Irpin in the center of the town during the battle, damaged by a mortar. Well, we realized that we wouldn't take the car back. Did the armored car save people's lives? Yes, it did. Here we are at the car cemetery, and I remember all these cars standing on the bridge. It was one of the most horrible things I've ever seen. I saw life stopped. I saw how all these people left their cars hoping to come back in a couple of days or weeks. All these cars belong to people who tried to evacuate from Irpin. Most of these cars have cracked windows. Just look at the scale. These are hundreds of cars abandoned by people. The evacuation was ongoing constantly. People tried to leave on their own, and the enemy shot them point blank. You see, a mine hit, and part of the car was torn apart. So painful to watch. Look, the whole car had been shot through. A lot of Donetsk people who fled in 2014 lived in Irpin. It's Armageddon, just Armageddon. People were trying to rescue themselves from the war, and when combat action started, People came to the evacuation point over there, where the damaged bridge is. They left their cars and just ran away. Do you see any intact cars? Unfortunately, they're not intact cars. 
the whole world saw the photos of how people were evacuated from here, from Irpin. After the liberation of Irpin, we're making the first shots of what is here now. Here's the road of life. It's dreadful and painful. If this bridge was intact, it would be easy for the columns to enter Kiev, straight to Kiev, because there's an excellent road, a large bridge, but it was blown up, thus the plans of Russian army were destroyed. The plan to capture Kiev consisted in four directions. The first one was from Tuniv, which developed in the direction of the town of Bravery. The next one was from Sumy, which was supposed to reach the Odessa Kiev highway, the direction through the Chernobyl zone, and the next one was through the Zhitomir highway from the Belarusian border to the Odessa highway. Now that you said it, the defense of Kiev for millions of viewers would look differently, because we didn't realize it. We thought that Kiev was all about Bucha, Irpin, Hostomol and the Chernobyl zone, but it turns out that if Cherniv hadn't been kept, if Sumy hadn't been kept, then there would not have been such success in Kiev region. That's right. At that time, the Russian army came from three directions, including Bravery and Cherniv. If they had broken through the defenses in one of these directions, then we would have to blow up the bridges in Kiev, namely Patton Bridge and the Metro Bridge. Did you think about it? We discussed all that. All the bridge were mined. There were necessary units with instructions to blow up these bridges in case of breakthrough, to cut off the moving from the left to the the right bank. We were ready for this every day. We were ready for any decisions. Look, the bridge on the map was blown up. Well, the tank will not pass. You have a tank, right? Yeah. We took unique shots of the first tank entering Hostomol, how it was looking for a way to get through despite the blown up bridges. We're going to reconnaissance to see if there's a bridge. Well, they probably drive along these roads. Wow, the shots. I've never thought that at home, almost in Kiev, I would work as a war reporter, fearing the attacks of Russians. Unfortunately, there is no bridge. It's destroyed. And this bridge won't hold either, right? This one is break completely in the middle. Okay, let's go there and see. Let's go. Let's go. T-72. Our task is to cross the Urban River here. Now we'll go and look at the bridge on which the crossing is planned. It's totally blown up. No chance here. Look at it. We saw the legendary tankman named Adam Worker. He fights in my group, managing the actions of the tactical group. He performs the most complex operations where it is necessary to show resourcefulness, and he's good at that. Adam is still planning to do the impossible here. He's going to descend here. Maybe turn the tank gun back. To cross the blown up bridge. How is that possible? We'll see now. And here is the moment itself. 
Our guys are doing the incredible things. It seems it worked. Yes. Great. The bridge even shook. Well done. Just well done. So cool. I'm bursting with pride because for the first time after more than a month of Russian occupation, a car with a Ukrainian flag is finally driving along Bucha. Bucha is liberated. Together with your guys, with the patrol police, we were the first journalists to enter the deoccupied territory of Bucha, Erpen and Hostomo. It seemed like a nightmare. But this, well, this is war. This is war. These are the consequences of war. Window panes are broken almost in every house. You can see traces of shining everywhere, as well as the hits of residential buildings. There was an explosion. Obviously, not very old one. The place is still burning down. Guys, do you have a piece of bread to share? We took nothing with us. Cookies, we had cookies. Wait, I have a soldier over there. That's the real disaster. People don't have anything to eat. I forgot what bread looks like. I'll try to find something else. You just wait. When did you eat for the last time? I haven't eaten for three days. Look. This is kind of camping food. Here, there is borch, porridge. I have boiled water. Wait, we have more. Some chocolates. Where are the heads intense here? Oh, it was so crazy. Half of my house was blown away. You think why I'm sitting here? My wife had a heart attack. This is some kind of hell. Hold on, old man. This is the place where fierce fighting was in progress in the Cerberus of Urpen. Everything is just smashed. An air battle here was so crazy that you just couldn't raise your head. Our attack plane was chasing an enemy's one to avoid being hit. The Russian plane simply dropped bombs. It was dropping bombs and worth throwing. I survived the Donald Scareport battle, but I didn't see anything like this. They're very cruel. They don't care about civilians at all. What happened in the city? Because we are the first group to arrive here. It was crazy. We'll be sent to heaven immediately because we've already been through hell. I'm a native born here. I've lived my entire life in Bucha. It's so horrible to see all that. There are three people there, three civilians. They gave us an hour to bury them all. Our three men shot for nothing. This one was killed in his own house during the first days. He opened the door and they shot him in the forehead. Did you know these people? Yes, all of them. This guy's name was Leonid. I woke up at 7 a.m. I heard how a Russian soldier asked him to show his ID. And he says, I live here, look, this is my apartment. And the Russian soldier says, he talks too much. And then he shot him. That's it. And this guy was killed around 12 days ago. A drunken Russian soldier called us all and said, unlock your cell phones and take them out. The guy was taking out the cell phones and a Russian soldier shot him through the doors. These Russian soldiers are sick. They were shooting, everything was flying everywhere under their shots. And we were digging, we were a person torn by pieces. Not only they killed him, but they also threw a grenade on him. It just... I don't know, it's such an incredible condition. Well, kind of... I don't know. 
You feel the tragedy that it happened in such a way that we couldn't protect them. And now we go out into the street where the very first column of Russian armored vehicles was smashed. This was the very successful volley that saved so many lives. There is a large column in Buchel. How did we crash it? Well, first, the locals helped the soldiers to direct the shots. Secondly, our guys knew how to play computer games. Really, and they joined the army. They learned how to shoot pretty good on that laser tag. And later, when asked how they did it, they said, it's like a computer game. Direct and shot, direct and shot. They burned everything. The head of the column, the tail of the column, stopped. There's panic, and then they begin to destroy it. Thus, the whole column is being destroyed. What kind of weapon it was? Various kinds of weapons. The Russians, who were marching as if on parade, of course, did not expect such a resistance, since they were told that they would be greeted with flowers. This is it, if it can be called a greeting with flowers. The local directed the shots. They gave the coordinates of the enemy columns. The info got to the relevant headquarters right away, and they knew exactly how those were moving. The locals removed all the road signs, so the Russians didn't even know where they were. Kind of a small tank. It just flew away. It just flew away. I'd prefer not to see such a disaster. There it is, an exploded ordnance. If you look carefully, I will not touch it. There was no hit on the capsule. I mean, a good hit and it will detonate. It's very dangerous here. Our country is now called the most mined country in the world. This problem will remain, and it will remain for years, for decades. Be careful, mind your steps. Dmitro, you've just almost stepped on a shell. Which one? This one. We detect mines every day. We do mine every day. Moreover, we detect them again in those places where we have already checked. Well, it means there's a huge amount of work, and we're even expanding the explosive technician units. They're carrying in the so-called clow. This is a rope which they will use to open the door in case there's a trip wire. Please hide behind the tank. They open the door, it's clear. Preparing to withdraw, they mined everything behind them. And we have consequences, great losses in the national police. Our guys get injured, including explosive technicians. There is not a single apartment that the Russians have not broken into. All apartments are broken into. This door is interesting. We'd better not open it. There is a blanket, a suspicious door. The sappers will check. It's unclear. I remember we entered the house and saw a V1 grenade. Here is a grenade, a tripwire. When the basement hatch is closed, there will be an explosion. Do you know what I started doing? I was looking for the best angle for taking video. Is it seen from there? Can I comment now? So that both the grenade and me could be seen. Should I go here? Otherwise, I won't be able to see. Uh, it's scary to look at. This is a real proof that they're mining houses. A grenade. The safety pin was pulled out. This grenade clip is pressed down by a basement hatch. And if you close the hatch, the grenade clip is released. The grenade falls, fuse for three seconds, and the fragment spread 660 feet. Looking back, I understand that it was dangerous. The grenade was hanging in the air. Either the wind blew or something. 
something touched the basement hatch and it just falls. What was the response of the police? Be careful, do not approach, and I approached. The question is what the consequences might have been. Is it death or injury for you, for the police, or the people around you, etc. You need to think a little about your own safety and the safety of the others, so I recommend you not to do that again. What are you going to do now? We're taking a small bag away and look how it fixed. Should I leave? Yes, please. Take the dog away. Oh, he took it. Look for a pin. Here. Wait. Help me. Have you spun it? Can I see it? My hands are a little bit... Your hands are shaking. Is the wire safe? Is everything okay? This is an ordinary paperclip. A paperclip? Yes. Well, will you take it? We will take it to the explosive technicians for disposal. And how will you take it? In the car. In the car. That's right. In our car. <laughs> what was the police for people before the war? They were dealing with delinquency. Patrol police dealt with speeding, for example, since February 24th. The situation has changed. Since February 24th, our function for the most part is to clear settlements. We check them for the presence of the enemy, the presence of subversive groups. There are garages back there. We got some information that Russian invaders were there. We'll go and check. Are they right there? They are. Tonight, yesterday, and the day before yesterday since they left. There are fires burning, and they are obviously warming themselves up. I heard them talking and the dogs barking. The guys are ready for combat. Take them here. Take them. We're checking the doors. A floor. It's closed. Do not pull too hard, Izzy. Go to the right side. Stop! Don't move! Hands up! Hands up! Out! Get out here! Get out! To the wall! To the wall! Why do you... You want to kill me? Stand against the wall and everything will be fine. We'll figure this out now. Do you have a Ukrainian passport with you? I do. Last name, Charlie. Year of birth. You'd rather not to stay in the garage. We don't know where the people are, you see. We were approached by the man who saw people in uniform and was afraid of them. His hands were shaken and he was saying, you will kill me. Give me a cigarette, please. Do you have cigarettes? When you were checked, you said, do you want to kill me? I was scared because the Russians were shooting people. My friend was shot from the very beginning. They killed him and buried behind garage. For the five days, they didn't allow me to approach the corpse, the troops. He says, I don't know who you are because the Russians were killing people. Two soldiers with weapons screwed their fingers at me. I unbutton and say, I'm civilian. Look at my sweater. I'm civilian. He's still like, come here. I said, can I just go? No, come here. Two Russian soldiers. Russians, yes, with AKs. I began to run away, zigzagging. The bullet went through my shoulder and removed my scalp. They were shooting at you? They were. My shoulder is pierced. You see? The bullet came out. It can be seen here. There's a scar here. It came from below and came out here. You were born under a lucky star. Is your ear sewn up? My ear was torn off and my scalp was here in front of my eyes. Do you have a family? Of course, I don't know where my wife and my child are. Because of March 9th, there was supposed to be the last corridor, but they shelled it a lot. And they went somewhere, right? Yes. So there is no contact with them, Nadia. Do you remember the cell phone number? My wife's, yes. Shall we try? Okay. Is the line ringing? It isn't. Do you know anyone else's number? My mom's. 
No, it's ringing. We've got a signal. Hello, hello. Mammy, it's me. This is Yaroslav. My boy, my baby. I'm fine, Mom. I'm safe and sound. I'm calling you using an officer's phone. Police, they gave me the phone to call you. I'm in Bucha. I'm in Bucha. Call Oksana and Angelina and tell him I'm alive. Artem was killed and... I know. Ivan Ivano was shit too. We were together. They didn't let anyone out for five hours. They shut you right at the door. A burst fire in the head. It's a miracle that you're alive. This is a miracle. It is impossible to listen to all this without tears. This man is Stalin who survived and who did not. Okay, mom, everything is fine. I love you. Thank you. The war deprived us of the usual things. Electricity, bread, connection. What usual things did the war take away from you? Many more things. How it was before the war, when you were looking at the person, even if this was an enemy, you thought that you had to give them a chance. You needed to hear them. And this person, maybe they don't know. And this information flow on them. And they're not guilty. No, they are. You support the war. You're a killer. That's all. This war kills people. To support it, you're a killer. And there is no need to talk or look for a reason why. It's unnecessary. Basically, I'm a civilian. I guess I'm peaceful. But I suddenly felt that I couldn't definitely kill. And moreover, I want to kill them. I do. On April 1st, 2022, I had probably the most terrible expedition of my life. An expedition to Bucha. It's so horrible. The bodies of civilians. With my own eyes, I saw this street, which was covered with corpses. And I'm talking to you now, and I have the old man riding his bicycle with groceries in front of my eyes. An old man. He was riding his bicycle and... What a nightmare. So many dead people. It's horrible. The whole world is shocked by these photos. And Vladimir Putin says that it's a fake and a provocation. He's a tyrant, an awful man. One has to accept the results of his actions. You have to talk about it and admit it. What that your goal and your purpose? You think that you have an operation of denazification, of de-Ukrainization, whatever you're doing there. So why can't you say that you did it? He says, well, it's a fake. This is a theatrical play. Well, this is his weakness, and he's even, he's just a weak person. A killed man. Another killed man. It's a nightmare. And here, look, another killed man, face down. It's horrible. And here on the road. What a nightmare. Oh God, it's hell. What a nightmare. You were also in Bucha, you also saw it. What is Bucha for you? The face of Russia. It was when I finally realized it. His hands are tied. He's a young man, he's probably 30 years old maximum. His hands are tied and he was killed.
I'll try to collect my thoughts now. I just don't know how. It's their face. It's torturing people, killing children. Well, it's their way. You remember that street, right? It's not very wide. That's it. They're a bloody path. They only have one road, one way through. Stepping over living people. Such a way in one direction. And this is their wish for us. And this is their main feature. It's what I think. It's what they are today. At that time, we thought that butcher was the most terrible thing. But we still didn't know about the tortures in Belaklia. I have a friend here. He was tortured to death. I will never forget a village in Cherny region where they kept children in the basement. And these are the pictures our children were drawing. An embroidered towel that our soldiers will come and liberate us. And they kept a calendar noting how many days passed and who died. A list of who was shot. So many dead people during a month. Yes. Remember Izium, the mass graves. <laughs> no comment, no comment. A loop around the neck, everything is clear here. It's scary, this is genocide. Totally, here it is, the Russian world that has come. This is the face of war. This is the cruelty of the enemy. This is his inhumanity. Did you dig him up today? Yesterday. <laughs> we still don't know a lot of things. We haven't been to Mariupol yet. Yes, we haven't. There won't be enough devils to cook them all in hell, right? They're beasts. The silly cat mas how do you shoot I don't want the mas and is to move in a 0432 We'll see what happens next. How do you think what will happen? We will fight till the end, until we win. And I'm sure we will win, because if I hadn't been so sure, I wouldn't have spent eight years of my life on this war. Вечность <laughs>